welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. This is the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. We begin with the opening prayer. You pull on your work boots, crafted from love. You hang justice and peace on your tool belt. You take on rebuilding neighborhoods when we would walk away. What have you to do with us, holy God? You model compassion for us. You take us by the hand to lift us to our feet. You show us the path which leads to humility. You leave a trail of grace crumbs so that we might follow. What have you to do with us, brother of the poor? You call us to serve by your side. You plant words of peace deep into our hearts. You raise up little children to whisper hope to us. You stand by the side of all who look for life. What have you to do with us, spirit of grace? You teach us how to build up others with love. What have you to do with us, God in community, holy and one? Everything, it turns out, everything, as we lift our prayer to you. Amen. Next, we have the call to reconciliation. The Spirit of Jesus comes into our midst with authority, with the vision and power to expose the sin in our lives and in our world. The Spirit of Jesus also assures us that forgiveness and restoration to new life is real and present to us. So let us make our confession before God and one another. Please join me in the prayer for forgiveness. Merciful God, we confess our complicity in the lies of racism, sexism, and classism. Whether we have benefited from these lies or been subjected to them, we have been silent when others are disparaged or held in contempt. Forgive us and liberate us from the enslavements of our world. Restore us to a life of maturity, love, and justice for all. Amen. The grace of God is sure for each and for all. Be restored to right standing with God and with one another. Know that we are set free and empowered by God's Spirit to create loving and just communities in our world. Thanks be to God. The first reading for today is from Psalms, chapter 111, verses 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the words, works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full in honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter, verses 21 through 28. Listen for the word of the Lord to you. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join your hearts with me in prayer? Gracious and Holy One, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was the Sabbath, and so naturally the Jews of Capernaum went to the synagogue. Some of them went sleepily, others went with a great weariness following a busy week of work. Still others trekked over in a rather irritable mood for who knows why. Maybe it had been no more than that they were out of cream cheese and a good bagel at breakfast that morning just wasn't any good without it. Maybe the kids kept them up in the middle of the night and the cat cried and who knows, maybe there was a fight with a spouse. In any event, something set them off and they weren't in the right frame of mind when they approached the synagogue. Still others arrived having bickered with their kids on the way over. Well, we're going to God's house for pity's sake. Shape up. It was the Sabbath. And so naturally they went to the synagogue from various paths emerging from a variety of experiences in the week past, a wash and a welter of experiences and differing emotions and mental states, they came. They came because, among other things, it was their pious habit to do so. For as long as many of them could remember, they had gone to synagogue on Sabbath morning. It was expected. You went to the synagogue, you moved your way through the fairly predictable liturgy, listened as the scribes read a portion of the Torah, sang a Hallel doxology, and then you went home for the feast day meal at noon. It was the Sabbath, and so naturally they went to the synagogue. But on that particular morning, Jesus of Nazareth was there, and his presence would create a worship that no one would ever forget. 
this Jesus stood up as some kind of roaming guest preacher that day. Few, if any, had heard of him before, and once they looked into the bulletin and saw that he was from Nazareth, not perhaps a few groaned inwardly. But then he started to teach, and although he was no John the Baptist, full of theatrics and arm-waving fire and brimstone, there was something striking in the way this Jesus spoke. It wasn't just that his ideas and vocabulary were fresh and innovative, and it wasn't simply that he was a better orator than they at first had surmised. Rather, there was something in the presence of the man that made you want to sit up straighter. Even the teenagers who had worked so hard at creating and perfecting this bored, stiff look on their faces. And this is before AirPods, so you can imagine they had to work really hard not to listen. They couldn't help perking up, slouching a bit less and listening more closely than they cared to admit. This man had authority. He had a moral gravity of weightiness and substance to him that people found difficult to explain. Somehow they sensed that this man and this odd new message about God's kingdom, he was, were maybe one and the same thing. This man's impact had nothing to do with any seminary diplomas on the wall. It didn't stem from his having been ordained and it wasn't because he'd been out in the world practicing his carpentry. No, this man was the message. They couldn't quite put their finger on it, but this man packed a wallop just by virtue of being there at all. Now, a few folks started to whisper their amazement, even as others maybe scrawled a furtive wow on the bulletin and showed it to the person next to them. They were just starting to realize something extraordinary was happened when suddenly, up from the back pew, a shriek went up. Wah! People's blood ran cold. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to wipe us out already? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Well, this didn't happen every week in worship either. Some folks started to murmur and fuss. Maybe Bill forgot his meds again. Maybe we should get someone to get him to the fellowship hall and get him a a cup of something. Be quiet, Jesus commanded. And everyone there was glad he said it because it was on the tip of their tongues too. You can't tolerate that sort of thing in church. Everyone in the synagogue had been thinking be quiet and so they were glad Jesus said it out loud. But then Jesus said something that no one else had had in mind. Come out of him. And no sooner were those words out of Jesus' mouth and the man convulsed. He shook like a leaf in a violent wind before shrieking one last time and then collapsing into a heap. But then the hapless fellow was better. The fire had gone out of his eyes and a look of calm came over him. At that precise moment, however, he was the only calm looking one in the whole place. Everyone else was scraping their jaws off the floor. This just didn't happen in the synagogue. A spirit inside of a man was not something that could be cast out by another person just like that. 
Normally people called upon Yahweh to cast out a spirit, but this Jesus, he just told him to go and the spirit went. There was no intermediary. intermediary. It was just Jesus speaking to the spirit and the spirit obeyed him. This was a different kind of authority, far different, in fact, than anything they had ever seen. Today was a different day. They had encountered Jesus and no one could think of anything else or talk about anything else for a long time. It was the Sabbath. And so they went to the synagogue as they had always done. But on that particular day, by the time they returned home, the people who had been there had the overwhelming sense they had been in the presence of God in a way that was anything but a typical day. But then what they didn't know at the time was that the Son of God would be present on that day too. The thing is that we Christians go to church each week, whether we go in our pajamas and slippers or our yoga pants and sweatshirt, or maybe at home you put on a tie and blazer yet, but we go, we worship, and we know, we expect, we've been told and trained that the Son of God will be present via the Holy Spirit. But do we expect that this living presence of Almighty God will shake us up? make us exclaim over the power in our midst? Do we expect that we will see and hear and be taught with authority? Now, maybe we don't expect or even need the kind of razzle-dazzle spirit casting that the people of Capernaum saw that day to know that we have encountered something wonderful. Because when you gather for worship and Jesus is there, anything can happen. But what we know is something life-giving will happen every time. We should come to worship expecting authority not just of word, but action. The Jesus that we come to meet is a Jesus who commanded that spirit to be quiet and then expelled it from the man, freeing him from a terrible bondage. Now, we don't hear anything more about this man in Scripture, but you can be sure the whole region heard about what happened to him. Jesus had backed up his words with action. We, too, come face to face with the powers and principalities of this world, the spirits of evil, every day. Now, maybe you're not seeing people bound to them in a physical way, but we see plenty of bondage in the modern day world, don't we? You only have to know someone with an addiction to know what bondage looks like. But we see also these powers and principalities of the world in the destruction of creation for short-term gain. We see them at work 
exploiting human frailties and human fears to build greater economic power for a few and disempower the rest. We see the sin of structural racism continually reinforced by good people who are willing to look the other way, to be silenced. We see everyday small acts of homophobia, of ageism, the cuts and bruises of microaggressions, the larger hurts of the world's displaced peoples roaming without a home, sometimes living whole generations in refugee camps. We cannot pretend in these days that we do not see. The bondage is real. As followers of this Jesus who preached and acted with authority, we must do the same. We build bridges, we name names, we bear witness to what we see and hear and always, always listen to where our rabbi, our teacher is calling us. In the past, we have seen our neighbors hungry and so now we feed them. We saw our neighbors needed a polling place and now we provided it. We heard our neighbors cry out from the terror of ice and destruction of the lives it left behind and so we answered. We heard our neighbors in need of holistic and accurate sex education and so we provided. We continue as disciples to seek ways to answer the powers and principalities of this world with actions. Our task as church is that continual listening to our teacher, to our rabbi, having our ears to scripture and having our ears to the ground how we might live our lives as disciples with authority, loving and living with action every time. Amen. Would you join your hearts with me in prayer? God of grace, you come into our midst with power and authority to liberate us from anything that keeps us from the fullness of life you desire for all your children and for the earth itself. Help us to be open to your presence, even if it means facing difficult circumstances that bind us and keep us from living fully. Help us to name the oppressive realities of our world that deform and deface human life and the life of our planet. Empower us to be agents of love and justice in our communities and the world. Eternal God, we ask your blessing on our nation during these days of transition into a new administration. Bless our new president and vice president and their administration. Give them courage and keep them safe. Help them to honor you by doing what is right, fair, and just for all our citizens and to heal the wounds of a troubled nation. We pray for them and for us all that we might serve the common good as engaged and faithful citizens with ears attuned to those in our midst and around our world who are hurting most. We pray for bipartisanship within Congress and among elected officials throughout our nation as they grapple with the serious challenges that bedevil our common life. And grant your church the grace to bear witness in its life to the reconciling power of the gospel and the justice it demands. 
God of compassion, we continue to pray for those whose lives have been most adversely affected by a raging pandemic. We pray for healthcare workers who work on overcrowded COVID-19 units throughout our country. We pray for all who are facilitating vaccinations. And we pray that you would comfort all who are sick or who have lost loved ones. Help us to be the agents of your love and comfort for those upon whom pandemic challenges have weighed most heavily. We make our prayers in the name of the one who taught us to say when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We celebrate God's life-giving presence in our church, our community, and our world. Let us now bring our gifts in joyful response to the many gifts that we have been given. You may contribute to Trinity Presbyterian Church through our online giving portal on our website or through uh, sending checks to our church office. Let us pray. Oh God, giver of all good gifts, we offer these gifts to you in return with gratitude for the gifts you have showered upon us, including the gift of our very lives. May the, they and we bear your peace, love, and justice into our community and our world. Amen. Friends, the Lord God has raised us up to be prophets to our people. So have courage, hold on to what is good, return no one evil for evil, support the weak, help the suffering, and may the spirit of the living God empower us to work for peace and justice in all that we do. Amen. Shalom. Go in peace. <laughs>